Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. All right, welcome back, everyone. Hello, my name is Greg Wetmore. Um, I lead the software engineering team at Entrust. I have the pleasure of being the moderator for the last couple of sessions of the day here in the breakout room. Uh, so today we have a, a couple of what look to be really interesting sessions. Uh, first, Lori is going to share some of uh, her thoughts on um, uh, PQ in the telco space, and then um, colleague Blair, who's going to join us and uh, talk a little bit about um, putting PQC into lab environments. So, um, yeah, I'd like to introduce uh, Lori Thorpe today. Lori is the quantum safe industry lead at IBM. Uh, Lori is an executive leader with over 20 years senior level global experience in digital transformation and telecommunications. Uh, Lori currently leads the portfolio in, in industry efforts on the application of quantum computing and quantum safe in telecommunications at IBM. So, without further delay, Lori. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about some of the work that um, that we've been doing um, from a telco perspective. So under the GSMA, um, we formed a task force that we, we've named, catchy name of Post-Quantum Telco Network Task Force. Um, this is uh, something that we've been doing for just over a year, and actually we've ha we have some, first of all, some learnings that I think could be applicable across other, other industries. Um, but also I think we've made some really important progress um, that I'll, I'll share with you here. So uh, starting with a little bit of history around uh, the post-quantum telco network. So first of all, the GSMA is, it's a, it's a telco industry association that uh, represents the industry, the um, the interests of uh, the telco operators and of the wider telco telco ecosystem. Um, when we started looking at uh, quantum safe, we realized that because telco relies so much on standardization and interoperability, we realized that there was actually a lot of work that needed to be done at industry level before anybody could even think about starting on a post-quantum uh, journey uh, in terms of actual remediation. So on the back of that, uh, we got together, and this was started by, uh, in first instance, by IBM and Vodafone. Um, we went to the GSMA and we said, we believe that there are some, some gaps and some areas that we, that we need to uh, collectively address. Um, and that's where the Post-Quantum Telco Network Task Force started. So a year ago, we formed the task force. Um, we, have, we now have over 50 companies that are part of the task force. This includes um, over 22 of the world's largest operators, but it also includes a wider, a wider representation from the telco ecosystem. And over the last year, we've been busy working on um, in first instance, we started with an impact assessment. So we wanted to really understand what was the, what were the things that we needed to address. So what are what are what what were the gaps? What are, what were the things that were already being addressed in in other forums? Um, and we kind of looked at the starting point as the work that was being done um, by NIST and by other organizations that are also looking at, at algorithms. So I'm, I, I'm referring to NIST, but actually, because we have global representation within the task force, um, we know that the, the standardization of algorithms is also happening in other, in other forums. Um, then we started looking at the impact assessment, and we realized that in order to get to the point where we could think about remediation, actually we needed to look at the dependencies. And when we talk about the dependencies, if we assume that, um, you know, that Dustin is going to deliver us some standardized algorithms, 
then what are all of the other dependencies that, uh, that we need to consider from a telco perspective? So we know that obviously we have some dependencies on the work that IETF is doing, but then when you start to look at some of the telco-specific standardization, so when you start to think about things like 3GPP, when you start to think of GSMA and ONAP and all of these others, you realize that actually that dependency matrix starts to get really, really complex and requires some sort of careful, careful coordination. Um, so that was sort of that first impact assessment. Then what we started doing is building on that impact assessment, um, we started looking at what were the things that the telco ecosystem actually needed to be able to prepare for the post, this post-quantum journey. And on the back of that, we also published a second document, and this was only a few weeks ago, where we started looking at the guidelines for quantum risk. And again, this is through the lens of the, tel of the telcos and through the lens of post-quantum. So we've started to try and make it very specific to um, the telco industry and started really looking at who would be involved, who are the different stakeholders and, and the ecosystem that would be involved. So going back, so why PQTN? So this is actually um, the rationale that we presented to uh, the technology group, which is the, the sort of the group under which the Post-Quantum Telco Network Task Force operates, to, um, to sort of provide a rationale for why we needed this group and where this group fit in the context of all of the other groups that, that exist out there. Um, including IETF, including 3GPP, and et cetera, et cetera. So I mentioned that the members of the PQTN, um, we have over 20 operators that uh, represent all of the different geographies, um, but we also have sort of telecommunication infrastructure, cybersecurity vendors, we've got representation from different regula from regulators, from government organizations, hardware, software, cybersecurity vendors. So we've got quite a, a large repre representation of the, of the telco ecosystem. And, and this, is, this is important because actually this has been really fundamental in um, supporting some of the discussions that we've had in the context of the task force in order to actually shape the way that we're, we're structuring the, the guidelines and the, um, the, the work that, that we're doing. In terms of the ongoing work items, there's probably one, um, one work item that I'll spend a little bit of time on, which is here it's called the best practice document, but we're, we're searching for another, another, another name for it because we don't think that best practice is necessarily the right, the right way. I think aspirationally we want it to be best practice. At the moment we feel that that's going to be probably an iterative, iterative document. It will probably be a working document that before it gets to the point where it's best practice, I think that there's, there's sort of some work to do. But fundamentally, what we've started doing is looking at the different use cases, the different places in the telco ecosystem where um, cryptography is used. And, um, and interestingly, when, when we talk about the use of cryptography, there, you know, we still get many comments that say, well, no, I don't, I don't use cryptography. It's, it's, not, it's not a problem. Um, which clearly sort of is, is you know, that, that's sort of a red flag in itself. Um, but what we're now doing is looking at the, uh, the, the use cases, the areas where in telecommunication we're using cryptography. So for those that are familiar with the telco network, for example, eNode B to security gateway, um, SIM, so both physical SIM and remote, so SIM provisioning, um, roaming, billing. So we've got all of these use cases. And what we've started doing is we've started doing a detailed analysis of what it's going to mean to actually make these use cases quantum safe. So what are the dependencies on from a standards perspective? 
what are the dependencies on the ecosystem of uh, the sort of the, the supply chain. Um, and then we've also started looking at what are the different solutions that can be adopted. And we spent three days last week going through in detail each use case. And one of the conclusions is that there is a lot of work still that needs to be done. So the devil is, very, is, is really in the detail. Um, and, and that was sort of my comment to one of the, one of the, the presentation from, that we had just now from Jaime, is that I really believe that the complexity of this is being largely underestimated. Because when you look at the high level phasing where you know education and awareness, discovery, prioritization, remediation, it doesn't even sort of skim the surface of the complexity of what of, of the decisions that need to be made for each and every use case. So in the case of Telco, for example, we had a long discussion around um, what happens when, for example, different um, algorithms are being chosen in different geographies, because obviously Telco is global. We expect to be able to use telecommunication services across different geographies seamlessly. Um, so what happens when we need to reconcile the fact that maybe one geography is using one algorithm and another is using another? Um, how do we ensure that that all continues to work and that there is an acceptable security baseline that is used across, across the board? Um, we had long discussions around hybrid. Um, so what does hybrid mean? And some governments are now saying, yes, we want hybrid. Others are saying, no, we don't want hybrid. So again, what happens when we need to make these work together? So this is one of the things that came out of, out of the discussion on this use case document, which is really starting to look at the details of how you would actually go about the remediation across the different, um, the different specific use case um, where you have a combination of dependencies on in-house capabilities and, and third-party suppliers. The education and awareness piece is, is something that is, um, it's, an ongoing, it's an ongoing piece of work. Um, what we have seen, and I think this is also reflected in some of the, some of the previous um, presentations, is that um, many people believe that security and cryptography is just something that needs to work and is definitely somebody else's problem. Um, so that education and awareness piece is really, really critical because what we what we see in the telco space, and, and I imagine that this will be reflected in other industries, is that this can't be just the problem of a, an isolated security team. It, it will need cooperation and, and governance and management across, across the wider organization. Um, we are cooperating very closely with many of the other um, relevant industry bodies and SDOs, so um, we, we have a sort of a, a close cooperation with some. We want to establish a closer cooperation um, with others. Um, we are also liaising with many of the government organizations. So what we're seeing is that more and more um, through the work of the PQTN, we've had various government organizations that have either joined the task force or that have reached out and that are basically looking for um, either support with some of the work they're doing or are looking to cooperate. So, you know, most recently we, uh, we've been talking to US government, we've been talking to some parts of the Canadian government, UK government, um, and many more have, have reached out. So I think we're seeing that this is something that is gaining traction, um, but probably not enough. And I think one of, the, one of the, the, the things that we've sort of heard consistently across the, uh, across the, the previous presentations, um, often action 
requires somebody to be saying this needs to be done at this point in time. So we've seen quite a lot of the guidance that's come out is start planning without any actual deadlines. And I'm not sure how effective that is. So I think what we'd like to see more of is maybe raising the awareness, first of all, that this is a difficult migration. Second of all, that um, you know, just start planning might, might not be quite, quite what's, what's required. Um, one of the things that, um, that we are planning to do a little bit more of is now to start looking at POCs and testing experience. And actually, some of the presentations that I've seen um, today sort of lead me to believe that there is quite a lot of work that's ongoing already in this space. So what we'd like to do is start to bring some of that experience and sort of fold some of the lessons learned and the experience to make sure that that feeds into that um, the, the planning and the, um, the sort of the, the work that some of these organizations are now doing um, to prepare for their post-quantum programs and, and journeys. Um, I mean, underneath I've put, I've put the communication piece. I think this is really, this has been really, really important. So the way that we've been communicating as well as through the publication of documents is through um, the seminars that we organize at MWC. Um, so the latest seminar where we had, um, we had Blair and, and Dustin as well as, as many other speakers, um, that, that is sort of very helpful to raise awareness and to get more people engaged and more people involved. Um, I think there's always room for improvement in terms of how we communicate and how we reach out to maybe some of the people that we wouldn't normally get to, get to speak to. Um, but that is sort of definitely part of what we, you know, what we plan to continue to continue doing. So I said I was going to spend a little bit of time on, on the use cases. And what we're doing as part of this use case analysis is we've started with initial set, an initial set of use cases. As I mentioned, we see this as being a document that will continue to be a work in progress for quite some time. Um, so, which is why it's, it's now sort of changed its name from, from best practice. But here, when we start to look at the, uh, the, the use cases, we split them between the internal use cases and the external use cases. When we talk about external use cases, these are effectively some of the services that the, uh, that the service providers will be offering to their clients. Um, the internal use cases, in, well, I don't need to necessarily go through all of them, but this is basically around the, the systems that the operators need to, um, need to update and look at. Um, so on the external use cases, one of the things, one of the sort of interesting discussions that we've had is obviously telco underpins a little bit like financial services. It underpins many other industries. So when we start to look at some of these external use cases, these are services that are offered, for example, to, um, to electricity companies or to banks or to insurance companies or healthcare companies. So there is also a, a sort of a, a cross, um, sort of a matrix of dependencies there that also need to be taken into consideration. Um, in particular, we've been looking at things like protecting critical devices um, where there are some um, potential constraints in terms of how you would go about upgrading the cryptography that's used because some of these are sort of constrained devices or are difficult to reach or can't be updated remotely, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we've started, we've also started looking at what is the implication from a telco services point of view on some of the other industries that, that would potentially be impacted. Um, in terms of the use case analysis, we've started looking at scope, 
data discovery, the cryptographic inventory. So we've started sort of really going into the details of the migration. And the reality is that in terms of migration strategy, there is, again, a lot of choices that need to be made, a lot of things that, and, and some of those choices will be um, enterprise specific, they'll be operator specific, other by the standards and by the availability of products um, and, and standard implementation. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges is around legacy. So as you're all aware, many, um, many operators still have um, some of the systems that were, that were um, sort of installed many, many years ago, decades ago in some cases. So we've got sort of a legacy challenge that, that needs, to be, needs to be looked at. Um, but we've tried, we've tried to sort of incorporate this into all of the, all of the use cases. So in terms of considerations for the PKI consortium, um, so we, you know, we would like a closer cooperation with, um, with the, the, the various entities that are part of the consortium and with the consortium itself. So, you know, one of the questions, these are some of the questions that came out of the, uh, the, the discussion within the task force. Um, so how can we leverage synergies between the GSNA PQTN and the PKI consortium work? Um, and how can we also gain better understanding um, and articulate the benefits and, po and possible dependencies in aligning PKI um, evolution with the activities that, that we're taking forward within PQTN? So basically, this is an invite for the consortium and all of the people here and the, um, the people that are part of the consortium to um, sort of input, please do reach out and, um, you know, we welcome, we welcome feedback, we welcome input, and we welcome participation. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, Every time I learn a little bit more about an ecosystem where PKI and, and public key crypto is deeply entrenched, I, learn, I realize more how complex this transition is going to be. Um, certainly, telco is a, a space where you've got lots of security dependency on PKI. Um, maybe just to start out with some questions, I have one. Um, how much of the problem space do you think will require hardware refresh, and how much do you think you'll be able to solve with software updates in the telco industry? That is a very good question, and I don't have the answer at this point in time. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that we are sort of recommending is that um, the sooner we start planning, the better positioned we are to, to leverage things like technology refresh cycles and, and things like that. Um, I don't know at this point in time. It's it's too early to to say. Uh, I think some of the presentations that we've seen. Um, I I don't think we have the answers yet. Anyone from the audience? We have a few minutes for questions for Lori. Sure. Thanks. Um, just a question, because GSMA at least used to be uh, oriented towards uh, mobile applications, and the many of those are very resource constrained, and a lot of post-quantum uh, cryptography is very resource heavy. So have you looked into how you could uh, be compatible with all this uh, post-quantum infrastructure from devices that are this tiny and uh, run on a, a two AA batteries, as it is? Yeah, so we are starting to look into it. So this is uh, this is one of the things that uh, we've highlighted as part of sort of part of IoT in general. But I think there are some specific areas. So if you think of low power wide area, um, that's one of the areas where we will have some real challenges to solve. Um, so we've started looking into some of the sort of the performance. Um, results that, that are coming out of, of sort of the various testing that, that is being done. But we believe that that is one of the reasons that 
it's really important to start looking at each use case because until you do, actually, a lot of this is very theoretical. So um, until you start overlaying the algorithms to the use cases and the migration strategy to the use cases, a lot of these problems don't actually surface. But the, the short answer is yes, we have started looking at it. I don't have the necessarily the, the answers, but we've started looking at the problem. So you mentioned the different algorithms in different regions potentially. So do you see this problem today? So we delivered some pig guide to, to telcos uh, already today, and at least we don't see that currently today, like RSA and EC, and then we so, uh, I mean, don't you see this problem already today with classic algorithms, or is it less so? Well, I think that there's been a lot of work done to sort of to to solve the problem today, and it's been done more in an evolutionary in an evolutionary fashion. So there's some cryptography that doesn't have a de an interdependency between different operators. Um, there's some that does, um, and what has what has happened is it's been solved more in an evolutionary fashion. So. Now, with the requirement to potentially change many of these algorithms, that will need to be effectively started almost over again. And and you know, and there are going to be problems that are not necessarily even specific specific to post quantum. But you know, establishing what is the minimum requirement for, for example, if I own a network and you want your devices to roam into my network. Um, I need to establish whether actually you've got the right security to be able, so that I'm confident that you're not going to damage my network. Um, so this is all basically put back into question. So I think we've got the problem today, and I think to a certain extent it's been solved. Um, but this sort of places a requirement to to sort of re re look at. Some of the some of the agreements that that exist. Perhaps one more. Um, you talked about how telco was uh, an underlying technology in a lot of different places, financial and IoT and connected transportation and critical national infrastructure. Are, is PQTN working with any other bodies, um, industry bodies or or government bodies to to make everything work together? Um, so we are working closely with um, with some of the the sort of government um, organizations that have reached out um, around critical national infrastructure. Um, also within the post quantum telco network task force, we also have representatives that are working very closely. For example, with Five GAA or Five GACIA, which are organizations that work respectively in automotive and manufacturing. Um, but we welcome sort of working more closely. We, we believe that there's going to be a need to work more closely with other organizations from, um, from other industries. Okay, well thank you very much, Lori. Really appreciate your insights thank today. Thank you. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.